Hey everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd, hope you're doing well. And it is time for another vinyl update, where I am going to go over a series of LPs that have recently made it into my lovely record collection over here. Before we get into the records that I have chosen for the segment this time around, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, the good people over at Reverb LP. If you didn't know, Reverb is an online platform and app as well, which is a fantastic online place to buy and trade and exchange vinyl. It is a global record marketplace, so you have access to buyers and sellers all around the world. You have dedicated customer support, buyer protections, so you're not getting screwed over in the process of these purchases, a streamlined checkout process, and with the app, it's easy to buy at home or on the go, so you can keep feeding that vinyl collection. To see their site or grab the app and get more information, hit up the links down below in the description box and uh, s support who is supporting us. Thank you. Oh, all right, guys, this time around, I got I got a nice fat bundle over here that we're going to go through. Oh, so nice. So nice. First off, first off, I'm sitting right between two tens over here, baby. Two tens. Whoa. Um, <laughs> Let's go through the first one over here. Uh, the new Daughters record. Here's the money shot. Woo! It's dark and black like my soul. You really won't get what you want if what you wanted to get was uh, a big picture in the, uh, <laughs> in, the in the gatefold. Uh, so... I can't remember what the sticker said on the front of the plastic when I pulled it off, but I think uh, uh, the sticker described the vinyl as being like uh, some kind of London fog gray or something, if I remember correctly, but uh, it, it certainly does live up to that title. It does look like a nasty gray impenetrable fog, so uh, definitely not, not lying on that one. Uh, some pretty just very dark, minimal art and and just sort of packaging over here generally uh v very straightforward plainest font possible uh presentation of the lyrics on a one sheet and uh yeah i mean that's basically it you know the, the vinyl sounds great it's a decent pressing and uh the gatefold i mean it's not that long of a record not sure how necessary a gatefold was but i don't know gatefold's always nice i guess uh the kids see ghosts uh, record and packaging is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, plastic sleeve, black vinyl, plain white labeling with gray album titles on it. Vinyl sounds pretty good, uh, although it's probably just a digitally produced record, digitally uh, pressed record, so, uh, or rather, you know, it was just recorded that way, so you're just putting a digital signal onto an analog medium, so. Uh, very artsy lyric sheet over here with the lyrics printed uh, very cleanly in a series of paragraphs. Um, back of the album cover is, is okay. You know, it just kind of repeats that same image over there. It's, it's all right. It's okay. You know, nothing mind blowing or anything, but it is a great little record, uh, which is obviously one of my favorites of the year since it made number two on my albums of the year list. Even though I think in a lot of ways it is, it is kind of like uh, an EP in spirit, a perfect EP. All right. Uh, I have a couple, uh, related records over here that I had to get when I saw them in the store because in college these records really spoke to me. Uh, they were some of my favorite records to listen to. Uh, of course, I'm talking about Connor Oberst's Lifted and Fevers and Mirrors. Um, maybe some of you guys don't really listen to Connor Oberst. Maybe uh, you're too young. I'm sure a lot of people are maybe a little uh, closer in my age range. Uh, loved his stuff back in the day, his Bright Eyes stuff. Connor Oberst, you know, there are artists in every generation that kind of uh, <laughs> gain an audience and get popular because they're uh, sort of like uh, tortured souls, you know, and, and Connor Oberst is very much that guy, very much the tortured soul. Uh, the poems in his songs are heart-wrenching and depression, or bleh, bleh, can't talk, depressing, uh, pretty straightforward plastic sleeves on these, but thick, nice, thick pressing, not super thick, but... You know, it's got a nice density to it. The records sounded great. Uh, very happy with the sound quality of the records. Very happy after all of these years, after listening to these albums over and over and over through like some 
uh, pro- probably some illegally downloaded MP3s <laughs> that I nabbed off of a friend. Uh, I now own them both on vinyl. So, Connor, you got my dollar. After all these years, you got my dollar. Because I, I don't think I... Actually, no, actually, no, you know what? I did own Lifted. I did own Lifted at some point in college, and I don't know what I did with it. If any of you are collecting vinyl for a while, you know that sometimes through buying, trading, selling, borrowing, changes in taste, uh, records that you have bought way back in the day, they, they tend to come and go. And uh, this, I'm very happy that it is now back in my collection in a newly repressed format. Although, um, as much as I've always loved Fevers and Mirrors, I've actually never owned a vinyl copy of Fevers and Mirrors. Uh, interesting that there's actually like, you know, some mirror uh, effects going on with the album art over here. I do, I do appreciate that, especially since I do love looking at myself. I do love looking at myself. There you guys are in the camera. Woo woo. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, can we, can we get a, there we go. I love you. Mwah, 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 mwah. Can you guys see that? Can you see me loving myself? La, 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 la. <laughs> Sorry. This is why you guys watch this segment, right? It's, well, it's not a real mirror. It's a slide out. It's totally fake. The mirror is a lie. Uh, but also, uh, there, there's some very nice photos of Connor and the band looking, uh, looking real emo in, uh, <laughs> in the album art. Um, you know, Connor Oberst, again, tortured soul, great songwriter, great poet, wrote a lot of good tunes. Uh, his songs were just painfully dark. Uh, I would definitely recommend Lifted over Fevers and Mirrors, though. I, I know Fevers and Mirrors is kind of the go-to record that uh, a lot of old heads say is the best, but I, I actually think Lifted is a little bit better. I do like how instrumentally ambitious and sort of high production value that record is, and I think it does pay off in spades. Uh, double LP... Gatefold, um, lyrics scrawled on the inside there. Uh, the vinyl is very good quality, just like uh, that of the lifted pressing. So, uh, you know, th this is kind of like in a repressing series for these Bright Eyes albums. Um, you know, st still own my uh, copy of Wide Awake, even though that's been repressed. I didn't need to grab a new copy of that since I already had that, but... Again, two, uh, two, two favorite singer-songwriter records of mine back in the day. Uh, I know Connor Oberst is definitely a little bit more of a uh, generational phenomenon. People who are a little bit older than me or people who are a little bit younger than me, maybe he doesn't really quite make sense. You know, I, I think uh, his, his stories and his songs really speak to a very youthful and teenage-type angst that I think you have to kind of be there for it, for it to really kind of, like, connect with you and make an impact on you. But, you know, I guess if you don't, mind listening to a record that's older and you feel like you're at that point in your life now where you're a young guy or girl or uh, uh, however you identify and uh, uh, you you feel like uh, uh, you, you've you just got a lot of angst you're working through right now, maybe his work will appeal to you. Maybe his work will appeal to you. Uh, next one, Black Flag, First Four Years. Um, I do love Black Flag. Black Flag is a great band, although there are some you know, later Rollins era records that I think are a little overrated. Um, I do love the early year stuff uh, better than, than some of the later year stuff. Uh, I do like the contributions that uh, guys like Keith Morris bring to the table in the pre-Rollins era. Uh, pretty much everything you're hearing here on this record, which is essentially a compilation, is uh, just work off of their early EPs when they had different singers and the recordings were way, 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 way rougher. Um, the songwriting style and the mix style really resembles that of, um, you know, that those first four off EPs. Tracks like Nervous Breakdown and Fix Me very much sort of resemble that that off sound. You know, this is obvious, which is obviously that that's just like a throwback to this. Uh, for as scummy and as gross as this record sounds, it is a thick ass pressing. Like, this is a heavy ass pressing. Uh, just a straightforward black vinyl, red labeling, and uh, just sounds really scummy. Great, fantastic, fast, aggressive in your face. If you are looking for a true blue hardcore punk record that is just balls to the wall and in your face, 
uh, highly recommend this one. This one is, is quite nice. Um, I've had a lot of these tracks downloaded for a very long time uh, since I was like heavy into punk back in college and um, happy to have them on vinyl finally. Uh, moving on from there, uh, finally got on vinyl for the first time, uh, The Avalanches, since, since I Left You. The Plunderphonics Classic is now here in the Fantano collection. Very happy that it is, it is has landed here. If you're looking for some incredibly funky and fun sample-based jams with a lot of soul and melody and beauty and grooves and grooves and grooves for days, please listen to this album. Do not miss out on this record. A shame that they were not able to follow it up sooner rather than later, but uh, pretty straightforward pressing here. Thick, nice and thick. You could kill someone with it. 33 and a third <laughs> rotations. Uh, the labeling is quite nice. And the gatefold is uh, kind of a nice blown up photo of uh, this, the ship that seems to have been printed onto the record labeling. Uh, very nice tiny fine print liner notes there. And uh, yeah, just pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. You know, the record like this is just good to have it on vinyl because it sounds You don't need a whole lot of flash in the packaging, in my opinion. All right, here's a bit of a throwback, a used copy of the debut Violent Femmes record, uh, an album that I highly recommend, a really great kind of early years folk punk album that uh, was so ahead of the curve that they recorded it and put it out in the late in, in the mid or late 80s, but it actually didn't catch on until the 90s uh, through hit songs like Blister in the Sun, Let Me Go On, Big Hands, I Know You're the One. Uh, lyrics scrawled in, in pure angsty fashion on the inside of the record there. Um, yeah, the Violent Femmes, they just like wrote really gross... <laughs> grossly dark and emotional and tortured like semi-acoustic punk rock with a, a, a really sort of rickety uh, I, I guess a rickety aesthetic to it um, Gordon's vocals and uh, his very again uh, uh, upsetting lyrics on this record and, and sad and depressed and lovesick and uh, they, they were they were unlike anything else going on at the time. So, um, yeah, I really uh, just love the fuck out of this record. Uh, love their follow-up album as well. Uh, Violent Femmes were a group that, uh, in my opinion, were not really appreciated enough in their time, even for as viral as the group uh, was in the 90s for, for a hot minute. Um, also, uh, if I remember correctly... Um, Gordon, he, he had an appearance in, a, in an old Pete and Pete episode, which I did love that show. All right, next one. I believe this, this one actually came from a fan of the show uh, who passed it along. Uh, this is like a Japanese import, a Japanese pressing of uh, Kenny Dorham's uh, Jazz Contemporary, which I'm sure this was contemporary when it was released in 1960. Uh, Kenny, if you're unfamiliar with him, he actually had a stint in Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers, and uh, had quite a few solo records himself. And uh, this album over here, I mean, there is a lot to it that I can't necessarily get into because uh, it's, it is in Japanese. <laughs> uh, however, it, it, there is some description of the tracks on the back, uh, which is nice. And um, it just kind of seems like some pretty straightforward uh, bop and modal jazz. You know, it's, it's not a bad record. The handful of tracks on it, good performances. It's one of those um, old school mixes where you had entire bits of instrumentation panned all the way to one side in the mix, like the bass and the drums in one channel, the panos and the horns in the other channel. And uh, the performances, uh, all in all, are pretty good, um, pretty tight. Uh, it's not exactly super aggressive hard bop or anything like that. It's very melodic. It's got a nice swing to it. It's very tasteful. Um, you know, not too over the top or anything like that. So uh, if, you're, if you're looking for like a uh, sort of like a nice, I guess, smoother brand of, of, of bebop, you know, I guess, I guess you can give this a, give this a shot. Kenny Dorham's uh, Jazz Contemporary. Again, dropped in a 
in 1960, and uh, I greatly appreciate uh, the dude who sent that over to me, or not even really sent it over to me, but uh, hand delivered it to me when um, I was out on tour, uh, when I did uh, my little East Coast South um, series of dates. And let's uh, stay on the, da the jazz train. Um, this next one actually comes from my wife. Yes, my wife. Uh, I don't know why I did that. That was like the cringiest thing I think I've ever done on video on this YouTube channel. And um, I know y'all are probably going to say something about the little pump review in the comments, but no, that was way cringier than any, any review score I've ever given. So if you guys just want to just never watch me again, I would not blame you. But anyway, so my wife got me this, this record, my beautiful, wonderful, smart, um, and uh, thoughtful wife got me this record. Before there was hip hop, there was the hip harp. Dorothy Ashby, <laughs> hip harp. This record came out, what was it late 50s or early 60s? Uh, does it say on the back here? I know I looked it up, but then I sort of lost track of it. But um, this, this is a jazz harp record. Yes, jazz harp which a lot of you have probably not heard such a thing before. And um, I'm not seeing the year off the, just sort of at first glance on here. And again, I know this was uh, Frank West, one of the men who was instrumental in establishing the flute as a jazz instrument. And there is jazz flute on this record, obviously. Uh, Frank West is mentioned on the front cover of this thing. But, you know, Dorothy's harp playing is, is really what kind of steals the show on this record. Uh, Dorothy's associate in this set, an extremely versatile musician, heard on alto and tenor saxes as well as flute with Count Basie's band. Frank blends beautifully with the uh, with Ashby's sound here. Originally an Oklahoman, Wes did much playing in Washington, D.C. in the 40s and early 50s before joining Basie in 1953. Yeah, again, not seeing the year again, but given that, you know, you're talking about people working and getting together with other people in the 1950s, you kind of have a, a sense of the timeline here. Um, and obviously... Uh, this couldn't have been super, super early because, I mean, in, in the days of, of sort of the, the I, I guess, uh, the, the, uh, I want to say the primordial days of, of bebop and hard bop, you know, you didn't have, uh, you know, jazz harps flying around left and right. Um, still even to this day, uh, you don't have a whole lot of jazz harp records. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it is a peculiar sound. Um, there is a lot of resonance to Dorothy's playing on this record. A lot of notes tend to ring out for a very long time, but it does add sort of a very beautiful and dynamic quality to a style of jazz that you just typically don't hear harp in. Uh, so again, you don't hear a lot of fr uh, flute jazz generally. I mean, it's part of the reason why I think Roland Kirk is so great. So you do get flute jazz on this record, but on top of it, you get harp jazz too. So two of the more unlikely <laughs> jazz instruments, especially for their time, uh, come together onto this one record of uh, there's seven tracks on this thing, and I've gone through half of it, and so far it was just friggin' fire. So highly recommended, a unique little jazz record from an artist that uh, up until this point uh, my wife had uh, never sort of like turned me on to this record before or told me about this record. I've never heard her listening to this record. She just said that like her dad used to listen to it and that um, uh, uh, she had just sort of like remembered it one day or something and uh, you know thought to look it up and thought that I would like it and I mean honestly it's great. So uh, Dorothy Ashby Harp, Herman Wright on bass, Arthur Taylor on the drums, Frank West on flute. So harp, bass, flute, drums, don't need much else. All right, last two records over here, but they are related. Uh, I got these over at Third Man Records in Nashville when I went over there and visited the store and the sort of distribution plant that they have down there, the sort of the main brain, the hub of the place. Uh, we have two records from the Melvins, Stag and Stoner Witch. Uh, 90s rock outfit, but they're still they're still around today, but mostly known for the work that came out with them in the 90s. The Melvins! Ah! Uh, two really solid records from their discography, especially Stoner Witch over here, uh, which a lot of people tend to prefer over Stag. I mean, look, uh, 
as far as like their 90s stuff with the Melvins, you can't really go too wrong. You know, you could really grab any number of records from that era and you're gonna hear something awesome. And the band was truly ahead of the curve on a lot, on a lot of stuff that I don't think they really get a lot of credit for because they're kind of like a, a musician's band. Like there are a lot of people who listen to them who are just like, total weirdos or other musicians who just like hearing experimental stuff, weird stuff, cutting edge stuff, bands that uh, are just sort of odd, I guess. Um, you know, people who are sort of like underground addicts and that kind of thing. Uh, th there are a lot of uh, mainstream music fans who obviously listen to groups that the Melvins have influenced over the years, but may have no idea who the frick the Melvins are. Although maybe that partially has to do with the quality of their discography kind of waning over the years, but to, you know, just give you a basic, basic, super basic rundown, uh, Houdini, as a starter record, is really good. It's really heavy. It's a really fun listen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty gutsy. Uh, really can't go wrong with it. Stoner Witch, is a bit heavier, a bit more badass, a bit nastier. Um, can't really, you know, go wrong with this one either. Uh, there are some weirder and sort of like lighter tracks on here where the band does their best to kind of provide a little bit of, uh, I, I guess, variety to the track list. They sort of embark on a few odd, silly little, somewhat tongue-in-cheek ideas where I think they, uh, uh, they show off their humor, their sense of humor a little bit more. And uh, Stag, is not as well regarded as a lot of the records that came previous to it, but I think that has to do with some of the ideas on this thing being even stranger, maybe not quite as aggressive and heavy. The band was incorporating more elements of like psychedelic rock and like warped weirdo pop rock, especially on like um, uh, cuts like uh, Black, uh, Black Bach and uh, Goggles uh, were two of the weirder tracks on here, certainly. And even Tipping the Lion had like a really odd mix to it with kind of a squelchy wow wow bass line to it, which is, again, not stuff that you typically hear in a lot of the Melvin's early stuff. There's also like some horns on here, some sitar. The band was definitely experimenting with instrumentation a lot on this thing. So they came up with like a, a lot of weird, goofy sounds and mixes and just kind of instrumental palettes on this thing to kind of build their typically heavy, sludgy, stoner sound out a lot. And, and that's the thing, you know, there's a lot of sludge metal sounds on these two records, a lot of stoner metal sounds on these two records. They're very gruff, they're very heavy. And, and even though the Melvins sort of have the punch and the, the uh, girth of like a, a sludge or a stoner metal outfit, they don't really take themselves as seriously as many stoner metal bands and outfits out there do, which I, I think has kind of prevented them from transcending into metal circles as, as much as I think they should have over the years. Um, but I digress. I mean, you know, just to kind of illustrate a point here, there are sounds and riffs and vocals on this record that sound exactly like ideas that would turn up on Metallica's Loaded and Reloaded a few years later, but, but way frigging better and actually nasty and badass and awesome, uh, not like, crappy and horrendous like in the way that sort of they pulled the ideas together on uh on those on those two records but i digress so yeah highly recommended uh these two albums uh for me and uh you know money shot nice uh nice gatefolds over here with some cool pictorials of what not let me switch that oh yeah oh yeah uh, this one is not a double LP. The stag copy is a double LP. Pretty straightforward, thick-ass black vinyl with that lovely third man labeling over here because this is a uh, third man exclusive reissue. And uh, given that it is third man records, you know that they sort of care about the sound quite a bit. And it does sound great. It does sound heavy. It does sound fresh as hell for something that was... Uh, sort of recorded and put out in the 90s, is very clear, is very heavy, and for music in this style, you do want it to sound gargantuan. So, The Melvins, Stag, and Stoner Witch, everyone. And uh, that is going to be it for this vinyl update, everybody. Hopefully you guys got some good recommendations out of this one. And uh, mwah, 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 mwah. I love you. Tran.
position. Have you given these albums a listen? Are they in your uh, collection yet? If uh, they are, then good for you. Over here next to my head is another video that you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. I'll see you guys in the next one. Anthony Fantano, Vinyl. Oh, and uh, make sure to hit up the good people. Link in the description over at Reverb LP. Support them because they're supporting us. And uh, yeah, forever.